Well, good morning, church. We are glad that you've come to worship with us today. I'd like to invite you to stand as we read from Psalm 100 this morning. It says, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Would you read this with me? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Amen? Amen. That is why we are here this morning. That is why we worship, and that's why we gather. So we're going to praise our God together. Yeah. 
take a moment and say good morning to someone around you. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Sunrise. Good to see you all here this morning and uh, sporting the Niners gear for the most part out there. I promised I would. There Apparently, there's some other team that's playing in this game with some other famous person. I don't know what the story is. Uh, my name's Cliff. Welcome to Sunrise, and uh, good to have you here this morning. A uh, couple of announcements for you. First off, if you are brand new to Sunrise, I would encourage you to stop by our information counter right out there in the lobby. Say hi there, and uh, they will give you free stuff as well as information about the church. So pretty cool. Uh, and again, we challenge uh, all of our people. Today is a message about sin and lying is a sin. And so do not lie to them and tell them you're new if you aren't, just so you can get the free stuff. There you go. Um, <laughs> sorry, we'll do announcements from the first service on the video. Uh, those of you joining us online, we're thrilled that you're here joining us today. We would encourage you to go online to sunrise.church slash welcome. Let us know that you are here. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Also, those of you here in the room today, just pick up that uh, prayer card right there in the seat in front of you, and you can uh, uh, be able to... Uh, Again, let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, there is also, this week we uh, introduced the monthly, we have a monthly newsletter we put out, and it's in the seat backs there in front of you. Uh, please check that out. I was pointed out an error on it on the back page uh, when it comes to the financial section. Uh, that information is not for December, it is for January. I had just had a crown put in when I wrote that, and um, who knows, the numbers could be all wacky as far as I know, but uh, that's the story there. Uh, the final couple of announcements. First off, coming up March 3rd, Kids Choir is getting started again. Third grade and up get to be a part of Kids Choir. Aaron Gallington, our choir conductor, leads that. That's happening on uh, upstairs at noon, right after this service on the 3rd, up in the choir room great to be a part of that. If you came to Songs of Christmas, you got to hear our kids' choir, and they'll be able to sing again in the uh, spring concert that will be coming up. On March 10th, the next Sunday, uh, at noon, right after this service, we are going to be taking a little bit of time to celebrate Pastor Jen Cole, our uh, pastor of women in discipleship, uh, who is moving on. And we are going to have an ice cream social uh, to celebrate Jen. So you'll want to be here at uh, noon on the 10th. And then final announcement, today is a Benevolent Sunday, which means uh, we will be receiving an offering at the end end of the service at the doors as you exit you can give towards our benevolence ministry and we were able to see uh, in the last couple of months uh, through that ministry a lot of families got to be blessed a lot of bills were able to be paid that were uh, in a challenging spot for some people cars were able to be repaired and all of that because of your help uh, and that goes towards people in the community but also uh, people that are here in a, as a part of our congregation. Uh, I'd like to invite our, uh, our I was going to say our elders, uh, let's go with our ushers to come forward at this time, and uh, some are already forward, and we're going to uh, pray as we receive the morning offering. Father, thank you in the name of Jesus for this gathering this morning of believers, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come together uh, to worship, to learn uh, from your word. Um, Father, we invite you to just speak to us this morning to convict us um, and to move in our midst, Lord, that you would have your way. And uh, as we give this morning, uh, we, uh, my prayer is that our giving would be done through joy um, and uh, out of a heart of gratitude for what you have done for us. And so, Father, we give to you this morning and would you have your way through this offering. In the name of Christ, we pray all of this. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we continue in worship. And uh, we have such a good God. Amen. And I don't know what you walked in with this morning, uh, but I know that we have a good Father. And He knows.
knows you and he sees you and he created you. And um, so we're just gonna spend some time in worship at his feet today. Verses six through nine say, for the righteous will never be moved. 
He will never, he will be remembered forever. He's not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. As we, we take a look at this passage and, and today and what we're walking through, I wanted to just give that statement that we can start with, which is, Lord, I admit that when I hear bad news, I often give in to fear. So please help me trust you in and then whatever that situation is. And I realize that today you probably arrived with more than just one answer to that statement. And, and there's lots of worry in our life. There's lots of anxiety in our life at times. And often us not wanting to trust God with absolutely everything is us giving into fear first and trying to find our own way out. So I just want to pray for us and then we'll sing another song. But I want to give some time after that prayer just so you can go to God. And whatever brought you here today, whatever burden you've been carrying, I really pray that you'll be able to just fill in this, this blank here as we get ready for today. Lord, I admit that when I hear bad news, I often give in to fear. So please help me trust you in. Let me pray. God, fear so easily takes over our lives. It's something that just is always prevalent in everywhere we go at times as we wonder just with decisions to be made, whether finance or health or this or that, Lord. And Lord, today we pray that, that we go beyond fear to a point where we trust that you, God, are in control, that you are sovereign in every situation. And that means whatever each and every one of us is going through right now. So Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we can put our trust in you. And we pray these things all in your amazing and holy name. Amen.
say it is well with our soul because we know who is taking care of our soul. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for these times when we can come and we can sit at your feet. We thank you for the God that you are. We thank you for the God that you have been, and we thank you for the God that you will continue to be, that you are good and you are faithful and you are true. Father, thank you for these moments. I pray now that you would give Luke every word. Father, give us ears that are receptive and hearts that are open to hear what you have to say to us today, that we can go away different and changed because of this time together. And we praise you in the precious, precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, sunrise. How's everybody doing today? They're doing good? No one's nervous about anything today? Uh, No one has, you know, when I... When I was thinking about that statement and I said, nobody comes in to church with just one worry, I realized that everybody came in with definitely the same, at least one of that's the same. And it starts at 3.30 today. Now, the good news is, is for me before, uh, or I don't have to worry about going over in the sermon because it's not going to interrupt any game or anything like that. Although I'm willing to take up the challenge 
but, but we find ourselves uh, in Genesis, and we're actually finishing our series today. Uh, before I get into that, though, um, uh, one little announcement for you. Uh, next Saturday, we are going to Turkey, or I'm heading there, Sarah and I taking our tour over there uh, to tour all the New Testament sites and uh, the seven churches and visiting uh, the, the footsteps of Paul. And for those of you who want to join us in person, it's too late, but virtually you can. Uh, and there are newsletters, our February newsletters are in the back of your seats and on them, you'll see a little note a bit about what we're doing. And it's got a link in there that you can follow. Uh, and every day we're gonna try and post some pictures, a little write up of what we saw. So if you do wanna follow along, see what's going on on the other side of the world and what we're up to, we'd love to have you follow along uh, with us on there. And we'll send out the link again in our e-news, but we thought it'd be fun just so you can, uh, can see what's happening with that. Now, today we find ourselves in an interesting place. Last week, we took a look at temptation and, and the patterns of temptation. And today we talk about sin. And, and, uh, and no one really likes to talk about sin a lot. You know, like we don't, it's not something that we just like to bring up at lunch conversations and, and, and just life, right? We don't like to talk about this. In fact, often we don't like to talk about it in church because there is this, this feeling of shame and guilt, which we'll get to today. And, and I know those words are big up there, aren't they? Like they'd be a lot better if I just shrunk them down just a little bit. Listen, here, I'll make you feel better for a second, all right? Uh, and, and you can throw that uh, next slide up there. There we are, all right, all right. Don't we feel a bit better now? But honestly, we are gonna be talking about sin, yeah. And so, and, and, and again, it, it, it makes us nervous, right? Because, because of this, and you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna dive in. We only have two verses that we need to cover. But I already, I feel, even though I've only been talking for 30 seconds, you know what? I'm going to distract you, all right? all right? There we are. All right. So, oh yeah, there's that. No, maybe the anxiety level just went up. I don't know. It's, you know, there's this, there's this nervousness when we talk about it. And if you got your Bibles, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, there we're going to see the, the sin and how, our sin and how it entered the world. And as we take a look at this, it's often easy for us to think of, well, whose fault was it first? And, and the reality is, is just like last week, as we looked at the, the patterns of temptation, we're approaching this morning understanding the patterns of sin. You see, Satan likes to use the same uh, methods as he did back then when it comes to temptation. And likewise, sin enters our lives in, in a very similar way, which often starts with temptation. And, and we'll get into it uh, in a second. But let's, let's jump to uh, Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the, eye, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sew, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. All right, so, so we take a look at this and there's kind of this pattern of sin that we're, we're gonna start to see. And it's, I mean, we have all sinned, right? This is nothing new to us, right? Uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet, yet again, this is why we look at it because for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet, yet there's a pathway out of sin. And, and we, we talk a bit about that in a second, but this is this initial slippery slope and step that Eve took that's found in verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now that, that word that is used in the original language there is not just, oh, I see a tree out there in the middle of the garden. It was to, to gaze, it was to behold in wonder. There, there was something special. She gazed at this forbidden fruit and she said that it was good for food, which meant she found it pleasant and appealing. 
and had somehow decided the fruit from this tree was more delicious than any other tree around her, even though she had already eaten from uh, from other trees. We know that the, in the timeline that uh, some time had passed, Ad, now Adam and Eve are together. They had obviously been eating and they've eaten from other trees. They never eaten from this tree, but they saw that tree and she saw it. And, and all of a sudden there's a fruit there. And I wonder what it tastes like. She becomes focused on it. And, and I think that's really that first step that we see is desire. Right, that the first pattern of sin often starts with desire for something. Most temptation begins when we see something shiny or spectacular. There's a reason why the advertisers are lining up to pay, you know, fifteen million dollars or twenty million dollars for thirty seconds of Super Bowl ad space because they will show you the shiniest, the brightest, the best stuff that you're just going to make a laundry list of things that say, "I want that." I want this, ooh, but I want that too, right? And, and that's kind of what, what happens, or not kind of, this is what happens. Once she's fixated, Eve, Eve's focus is now on the forbidden and it becomes all consuming. We see this elsewhere in scripture, Joshua chapter seven, verse 21, where Achan tried to explain the slippery slope that sin had in his life when he saw among the spoils, this beautiful cloak as they were, uh, as they were conquering the land, um, the land of Canaan. And he saw this beautiful cloak. And then after he saw that beautiful cloak, what would you, you wouldn't believe what was next to that nice cloak. It started with that coat and then, oh, but there's also 200 shekels of silver right beside that cloak. And wouldn't you know, right beside that, those 200 shekels of silver was a gold bar weighing 50 shekels. And all of a sudden it went from, I saw a shiny cloak to, and then I coveted them all and I took them all right? It's, it's a, a slippery slope that we often hear. And yet at the same time, after seeing the delicious tree, how delicious the tree would be despite never tasting it, Eve was mesmerized by how much delight it would bring her. It wasn't just the desire that, I, that, that she saw. It was without even, again, without even tasting it yet. There was something mesmerizing about what it would bring in return, the happiness, the delight that it would bring her. And it was that delight to the eyes, it, sa uh, it says. And the, the word here has this idea of greed, of craving. She saw it, she wanted it. And, and our eyes are the window through which most of our wants turn into cravings, right? We see something, we say that looks good. And all of a sudden it starts to build. Psalm 101 verse three says, uh, it calls us to be careful about what we allow our eyes to see. I will not set forth before my eyes anything that is, that is worthless. Job, Job, sorry, Job, Job 31 uh, reveals the connection between lust and what we are to allow our eyes to look at, right? And so there's a direct connection. She saw, but then there was this wonder, what will this bring me? Surely it'll bring me uh, something amazing. And again, this is that, that sliding, right? Nothing has happened yet. There's this desire. Then there is her wrestling with what it might bring. She knows only what the serpent has told her up until this point. And yet that desire grows further and further after focusing on how delicious it would be, after focusing on the delight that that fruit would bring to her, Eve now desires it more than anything. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. All of a sudden, that word desire in the Hebrew switches to the word covet. And has this idea of this craving, this intense craving. Listen, I, about two weeks ago, I did something that I've never done before. I, uh, I ate some vegetables. Yeah, I know. I, well, actually, I should rephrase that. I drank some vegetables. Uh, and I decided I would do this juice thing and, you know, start the year off right. Also, I kind of knew that I was going to Turkey and I love Mediterranean food and I, I figured it would offset itself, right? So, so I did this five-day 
you know, juice only cleanse diet, whatever you want to call it. In that five day period, never in my life in ministry have I ever had more meetings that revolved around food. I kid you not. It was, I mean, it it was, oh goodness, I didn't realize how this is going to play. But it was Sarah's idea. <laughs> how did I plan this and not realize how directly related this is to our... So anyways, Eve gave this stuff to Adam. And no, it's so... <laughs> Thank you. Have a great week. All right. So, so I, I'm sitting there and we started on a Saturday and there's football on Saturday. There was football on Sunday and I get into work in the morning and there is, is donuts there waiting for me in my office. And there is, uh, you know, and, and the staff now start to hear my, my moaning and groaning about all these problems, about how much I want some food. I mean, there was a point on the very last day that, that I had spoken in, in Sunday night chapel and 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 someone had brought me in a little thank you and cliff walked into my office and he's like i'm just the delivery person <laughs> this is with like 6 hours left in this ready to eat and someone had gotten me the biggest chocolate croissant pastry i've ever seen in my life and you know what i did no i did not eat it i had I put it in my fridge and I said, I'm going to eat that in the morning when I'm allowed to. And everyone told me, you know, just take it slow when you go back to eating. But all I could think about for the next 12 hours was that croissant, right? We've all, whatever it is, you've been so hungry that and you fill in the blank. You've wanted something so bad that you fill in the blank. Eve looked at this fruit, the wisdom that she thought it would give her, the delight, the food, the sustenance, everything about it. And she craved it passionately, it said. And, and what we see here is really part of that temptation that turns to sin and that, that, that pattern of sin. Instead of accepting God's definition of good, as declared seven times in chapter one, Eve decided to follow her own definition of good. And that's really that first part of, of, of sin, right? Is, is instead of taking God's definition of what is good for us in our life, we supplant that with our definition of what is good. And, and that starts that slope. In Genesis chapter two, nine, God's, had given every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But she redefined God's parameters according to what she had declared to be delightful, to be desirable, that would give her the most amount of happiness. And I don't need to really illustrate this from our own culture because this is the world that we live in. The descent that happens here is an illustration uh, of, of James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That descended pretty quickly, didn't it? It, it went from just a simple desire and somehow in two short verses, we ended up in death. And, and this downward, downward spiral that starts to happen is accelerated when Eve allowed herself to start slipping and when she, she found the fruit to be. And there's several things. And you see behind me, the first is physically appetizing. It was good for food. The temptation, this temptation looks like it will meet a legitimate physical need, whether it is comfort, whether it is sex, whether it is food, whatever it is. There is the emotionally attractive as well. It's the delight to the eyes, it says. This enticement comes to us as delightful, not disgusting. And remember, Satan doesn't tempt us with something ugly or atrocious. He, he always uses something attractive, like having the newest, the greatest, the biggest, the prettiest. And thirdly, there's a spiritual aspect 
as well, which was the spiritually appealing of making one wise, to be like God, to know everything that God knew. This is the appeal and the sin of of self-fulfillment and ambition in many ways. Eve fell before she had even eaten the fruit. Likewise, our acts of disobedience against God begin with our heart and with our minds as well. But there's something that I want to compare here that we can see when we look at this, what, what happens here. And it's actually mentioned in John or 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, which says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. Now, it's easy to say, okay, well, the world is out there and, and there's so much evil in it, yet God calls us to go out into the world and, and be a light in this world where we can share the gospel. But there's a direct comparison between 1 John 2.16 and Genesis 3.6. The lust of the flesh is, is that good for food. The lust of the eyes is that delight to the eyes. That pride of life is a desire to make one wise. Each part of what is happening in 1 John chapter 2 is a reflection of Genesis 3, 6. We also see these three temptation points when Satan unleashes temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. The same approach that Satan took with Jesus is the same approach that he takes with us. It's the same approach that he takes with Eve in the garden and, and with Adam and Eve as, they, as we look at this whole dynamic. The pattern is there. And that's why I believe we have to look at the pattern and go deeper into it. Because after getting the heart and the mind of this sin and rationalizing it, it turns into the pattern of disobedience. Right, the actual act. Once Eve perceived that this would be delicious, she plunged headfirst into disobedience. She took and ate the fruit, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The Hebrew word for took indicates that it was a decisive act. It was capturing, it was seizing, it was grasping. It wasn't pondering and thinking about uh, or anything like that. It was deliberate. It was intentional. And whatever rationalization was there, nonetheless, that act happened. Now, as we take a look at this, understand that there, uh, you know, let me answer one or two questions that often come from this. And then this might be a good chance for a a mid-sermon fun fact that you can share at all the Super Bowl parties today. Uh, And which I'm sure will make you very popular. There is no biblical evidence whatsoever that this fruit was an apple, right? We see it in all the pictures. It was an apple. And yet how many of you have apples in your fridge right now? No, I'm coming. <laughs> right? But we have no evidence that it was an apple. In fact, Michelangelo, when he painted the Sistine Chapel, used figs and forbidden figs when painting the ceiling. The idea of this actually comes from the Latin because the Latin word for apple and evil are virtually the same. And the Hebrew is not all that helpful at all because that word peri means produce. I do find it, you know, fascinating as we take a look at this. Yet every time you've ever watched a movie, every time you've ever seen a picture for the most part, what is Eve holding in her hand? An apple. But we, there's nothing in there that, so, so no worry. That's not the message today that apples aren't evil, but it's just mid-sermon fun fact. Af, because after Eve ate it and didn't immediately die, she then gave the fruit to Adam, becoming, bringing him into the equation. And instead she gave it to him immediately. You have to understand that he was probably in pro- close proximity. It doesn't say anything about time, like she ate it, waited around, waited for Adam to show up, but he was there. And I think one of the principles that we see is often uh, part of these patterns is, is how most people don't like to be alone in sin. So they encourage others to sin with them. And the principle behind this is we never fall alone, always 
or others are always hurt by sin in our life or unholiness in our life. Our disobedience will damage others. And again, you notice Adam was with her to have companionship together, which goes back to the opening passages in Genesis chapter 3. Now, it's easy to think that this is all Eve's fault. And maybe some of you have even been sitting here listening to the first half of this sermon, gently nudging your spouse being, I told you. But God holds Adam responsible. Right? And, and, and here's the reason why. So God holds Adam responsible for all of this. One, Adam was told to work and keep the garden in chapter 2, verse 15. He was, he was to guard the garden and keep out anything that would harm the harmony of what God created. It was Adam who was given the prohibition to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It was his responsibility as well to make sure Eve did not eat of that either. He was given the task of being that guardian and that keeper. According to 1 Timothy 2.15, Eve was deceived, but Adam deliberately disobeyed God. I, I think we can't ignore that. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived because and, and became a transgressor. What, what we see happen here is the direct statement that Adam deliberately, entered, deliberately disobeyed God's command. The command was given to Adam. That doesn't negate the fact that Eve sinned, but it was directly given to Adam. And Adam was the one who disobeyed God. As leader, God clearly holds Adam responsible for their sin. And it's because of Adam's disobedience that the whole world has been plunged into this darkness and depravity. And, and I'm not trying to make this sound horrible. Romans 5.19 says, for, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. When Eve sinned, Eve sinned. But when Adam sinned, all sinned. Right? It's a very clear distinction. I, I think as, as you look at this, it's also understanding that there's a pattern that has happened here. That's been completely flipped around. God's original design has been inverted by Satan in this story. And God's original design has been inverted in our world as well. Notice it goes, as God created, it goes from God to man to woman to animal. And then from the other way, what Satan has done, this entire story is animal to woman to man to God. It has completely flipped around God's design in all of this. The rapid fall of Adam and Eve is staggering. We've just read it in two verses. I mean, if you want to draw it out, it's seven verses and this all happens. The, the speed in which this happens is shocking. And I think we take that into our, our, own, in, into our own lives immediately. After discovering the forbidden fruit was not as tasty as they thought it would be, they now have what you could, and what many commentators call spiritual indigestion, immediate regret. And if you often notice that when something seems so good, that often they lose their appeal once you give in to them. After they disobeyed, they immediately felt disgraced. Both their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. They refer, this refers to their conscience, sin never makes good on its promises. And we see two consequences that come out of this. One, their eyes were opened as a fulfillment of, of Satan's promise to them in Genesis chapter three, verse five. When you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. They didn't know how that would be defined and what that would look like. And, and it was just ambiguous enough that it created that desire. But it immediately led to rebellion. The next is that exposed nakedness. And somehow they knew they were naked. In, in Genesis 2, 25, they were naked and not ashamed. And now they are fully exposed before each other and before God. The knowledge of good and evil did not make them like God. In turn, it made them feel guilty. They knew more 
but the additional knowledge was evil. No longer feeling safe about being seen, they put some le- le- uh, fig leaves together in a vain attempt to cover themselves. Because of the shame of their sin, they immediately tried to cover up. We see this in the last part of verse 7, and they sewed leaves together and made them into loincloths. Now, I think it's important to understand that the fig leaves were never going to be a long-term solution. They were only a, a temporary solution at best, and there's so many problems with fig leaves. They, they fall apart. You know, I'm, sh- I'm sure we can get into all sorts of things. Not that I've tried, but I, I'm sh- but. But every day or two, they wither. Whatever it is, you got to get a new outfit every two days. And I think there's something in there in understanding that, that when we try and cover our sin, we'll be able to cover it for maybe a little bit. But sin always finds a way to reveal itself. What makes us do it repeatedly? Knowing that it, it only hurts us. Is, is a question for the ages. It's the doctrine of original sin that, that theologians have debated over and over. We know what is right, yet we deliberately choose to do what is wrong. We're told, don't do this. And then we see something and we realize, you know what? Maybe we should do this. Remember, God. the, the whole premise of this is God spoke and gave commands and talked about presence and talked about... Uh, and, and talked about his presence and ways in which they could guard themselves. Every rule that God gave was about him giving stuff to them. And the only thing, the one thing that he told them not to do was so that it would not hurt them. And Satan's plan was to take the one thing that they weren't allowed to do and forget about all the glorious things that God had given them. Theologians call this word, I have a word for this event, they call it the fall. And you've often heard that statement. And and it means that when Adam ate the fruit, he fell from a state of innocence into a state of guilt. He fell from grace to judgment. He fell from life to death. He fell from heaven to hell. This doctrine of original sin in its plainest form is found here. Now, it's hard to believe that because of what Adam did, we're now living in a sinful world. Yet, as we tell ourselves day in and day out that we need to find ourselves in God's word, we see those guidelines that are able to help us as we walk through the patterns of temptation, as we walk through the patterns of sin. When Adam disobeyed, we were destroyed with that. When Adam fell, you fell. When he died, we died. To say it another way, although you and I were not historically there in the garden, because we are descendants of Adam, we suffer the consequences of what he did. If I was to put it in in plainer terms, Adam was the bus driver of humanity. When he drove the bus over the cliff, we went down with him. He was at the controls. It doesn't matter where we were, we were still on that bus. Which leaves us with how do we remedy this, right? It's the only question that comes out of this. And the answer is simple. You need the gift of God. Look at Romans 5.15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The gift came by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, answers that question. Even more, how do you get that gift? If it's a gift, it must be free. If it's not free, it's not really a gift. And since it's a gift, you can only do one of two things. You can either accept it or you can reject it. You don't have other options. This whole message comes down to one simple question. Have you accepted God's free gift of salvation that comes through the one man, Jesus Christ. Have you ever reached out the empty hands of faith and said, yes, Jesus, I open my heart to you and I ask, for, ask you to forgive all my sins. 
It's the one question that comes from this entire passage. That pattern of sin can be broken. Doesn't mean you're going to stop sinning. But it means there's a remedy to sin. And that remedy is Jesus Christ. Now, if you're sitting here today and you're like, well, I found that remedy already. I mean, sometimes we need that reminder uh, of the pattern of sin and how quickly it falls into our lives, whether it is the desire that lead, the temptation that leads to the desire that leads to that, what if this, this could be so wonderful in my life that leads to the act of sin. But because of Jesus Christ, you have the ability to have that act of forgiveness. If you're here and you know Jesus, there's a world that needs to know this one question. Like there's a world that needs to know the remedy for sin. The moral compass, the ethical compass of this world was designed to be guided by the biblical text. It's our job to speak that into this world. And finally, if you do not know Jesus, let today be the day that you know the remedy for sin in your life. Let today be the day that you know that there is a gift, a free gift for you. Its name is Jesus Christ. He died for you no matter what brought you here today, what worry, what burden, what sin you had in your life, it doesn't matter. He's stretching out his hand with that invitation to you. As we finish this and finish this series and, and as we finish with the idea of sin, we finish with the remedy. Let it be that reminder to us let it be that motivator to us of how we approach this world and to be on guard, to keep and guard our homes, our family, our lives. But also let it be the motivation so that others may know the true saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done in our lives. God, sin is, is not a fun topic because because nobody wants to talk about sin and the things that they've done wrong. Yet God, in this, we see that this story ends with this spiritual remedy of, of grace and forgiveness. Yes, judgment entered this world, God, but you sent your son and, and he came into this world and died for each and every one of us. God, let us never forget the grace that has come along with this judgment. Let's never forget the mercy that came along with this sin, the forgiveness that is available to all those who believe in the name of Jesus. And in so many ways, God, when sin creeps into our life, it is often a trust issue. It is fear that maybe you can't handle it and we find a way to do it ourselves or find out what is best for us. We take what you have designed as good for us and we've said, you know what, I've got a better idea. God, so we pray today that if we are wrestling with sin in our lives, if there are specific things in our lives that we are wrestling with, Lord, that we give them over to you now. You are great, you are mighty, you are powerful, you are creator, you are healer. You are the God who sent your son for us so that we may be forgiven. And Lord, we continually give glory to you for that. And we pray these things all in your amazing and holy name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we close together.
to thank you for joining us this morning. And if you've got questions about what we talked about, if, if there is sin in your life, if you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If, if you haven't found that remedy to sin yet in your life and need to know Jesus, we would love to pray with you, answer any questions that you may have. If we've got a prayer team over to the, the side, uh, you can send prayer requests. If you're watching online, we'd love to connect with you. It's, we, it's a topic that needs to be talked about. But we talk about because of how glorious the remedy is when you know Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us this morning. A reminder, it is a Benevolence Sunday. If you want to give to our Benevolence Fund, help those who are in need in emergency situations, uh, you're able to do that on your way out. If you are new, don't forget to, don't forget to uh, grab one of those gifts on the way out and stop by at the info booth. And I will say something that you probably won't ever hear me say again from the pulpit. <sighs> Go Niners. Take care.